Fry Talk with Lou White and Mark Davidson. Hey, good to see you. Hey, Lou, how you going? I'm fine. Everything's working well. Good, good. Boy, you look great today. Well, thank you. Thank you. Tonight. So <laughs> tonight. Yeah, thank it's, you. Tonight. Well, I'm, it's early right now here. I had a couple of cups of coffee. Can you do me a favor? Yes, sir. Switch on every light you've got in that room. Okay. Can you turn on those those overheads? And I'll turn on this one. This one right there. The one right up there lights up the screen. Oh, that's brilliant. Yeah, that's better. Oh, How's goodness. that? Does that work? That's wonderful. How are you, Phil? Hey, how you doing, brother? Yeah, good. Very good. Yeah. I love you. Yeah, I love you too. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, she didn't stay long today. Yes, it's a cameo. Yeah. You're That's working hard. We working hard, mate. Yeah. Yeah. Well, every day. Yeah. Yeah. Had a good uh, good time yesterday. The Shabbat was good. Yeah. Well, um, let's see. Who are we? Are we want to introduce ourselves. Yeah, brothers and sisters, welcome to the Torah Talk Show. My name is Mark Davidson, and I'm chatting with Lou White. Hello. Good to see y'all. Yeah. So you want to? Uh, you want to dive into this amazing uh, seminar? Why not? Sure. This is uh, something that a lot of people don't know about, and it's something that's below the, you know, the visual, and that people don't talk about it when they're listening to their preachers. But uh, there's something going on, and it goes all the way back to the church fathers, as they call them, uh, the people that uh, were hatching the doctrines and beliefs. And the New Testament, you know, the whole thing is, it's actually a renewed covenant, you know, that is written in men's hearts now. But they didn't go that way. They were kind of anti-Semitic. In fact, they were overtly anti-Semitic. Mm -hmm. They didn't want to have anything to do with basically host uh, the hostile rabble of the, of the Yahudim, uh, is what Constantine referred to it as. And the, uh, the pre-Nicene fathers and the anti-Nicene fathers had a subtle anti-Semitism running through them. But anyway, in the, uh, in the context of what we're going to discuss today, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to propose the title here is Toxic Torah. Uh, Torah is a Hebrew word, and I'm going to go into that. I'm just going to read the article, and then you can uh, ascertain what the point is about this. The Torah of Yehuda, or the... Torah of men, you know, which is it? Which one are we going to obey? The world always goes in the wrong direction, it seems. Hmm. Now, let's see. The, uh, the title, Toxic Torah, is also um, referring to something that has been around for about 100 or 150 years. It's called supersessionism. Now, that's where something supersedes something else. Something was, that was happening, and then something else comes along and says, well, no, we're not going to do that anymore. We're going to supersede that with another doctrine. And those are the things that we're talking about here. The covenant and the people themselves were supposedly replaced by an Alexandrian cult. Now, Alexandria, Egypt is what we're talking about, because that's where the school was, where these allegorizing fathers were hatching their doctrine. And we call it we call it Roman Catholicism. We we actually call it in the daughters, uh, the daughters being the thing, the, the daughters that came out of her, and retained her teachings, but yet re the, rejected her headship. See, there was a wounding of the head when the nobility turned away from the papacy as being the ruler, and that wounded the head. But the head is trying to get healed by ecumenism or the ecumenical movement, where the, oh, we got to go come back together again, under the head. Well, the, the wound will probably be healed, but here's, the, here's the, the article itself. If you're in this world, breathing air, you're probably surrounded by people who have inhaled toxic teachings. Torah is a Hebrew word meaning teaching. It's identical in meaning to the Latin word doctrine. The question is, which Torah is toxic? It may be Yahuwah's Torah or men's Torah, but you should test which Torah you are hearing before you take it into your vessel. 
uh, that would be your heart or your inner lamp. Commonly, the word Torah is translated into the English word law. We live in a highly deceptive world under the influence of an enemy called the dragon, who is also the serpent. Draco is the Latin word for snake or serpent. The teaching or training that we see conducted through those who appear pious are guiding the masses away from obedience to the Torah of Yahuwah. Some have been heard saying the Torah of Yahuwah is toxic faith. They take the perspective of the dragon. And if you do that, the Torah of Yahuwah will be a toxic faith. Because to, to the dragon, the Torah is toxic. Yahuwah's Torah. Now, the word supersessionism that we talked about, this is the concept that Christians who are in the New Covenant era replace, supplant, and take over the former identity of Yisrael or Israel. They usurp the promises, but they leave behind the moral obligations. Some call it replacement theology. It's a kind of identity movement. Its ideas originated in the incubator of Christianity at Alexandria, Egypt. These church fathers at this didascalia, or catechetical school at Alexandria, taught that all the promises made to Yisrael were now inherited by the Christian church. The covenants with Abraham, Moshe, and Daud are considered annulled. This church was and is the centralized hierarchy holding all authority over doctrine. It's, it wields great power because it is the first estate called the, the clergy, to which the other two estates, uh, the other two estates must submit, those two being the nobility and the laity. Those are the common people. There are, this is an artificiality, of course. There, this is a construction that the world is in. The prophet they call Jeremiah, or Yermiyahu, is quoted at Hebrews 8 and Hebrews 10, giving us insight into what is meant concerning the covenant. It is the same covenant renewed in men's hearts rather than being written in stone as the former was. Before proceeding with this study, you should read the entire chapter of Yermiyahu 31. In fact, the Nazarim are mentioned in verse 6. We're the Nazarim. You will immediately recognize how far adrift the church fathers were in their identity of Yisrael or Israel and Yahuwah's promises to them. Now, we're going to talk a little bit more uh, about a schoolmaster that's mentioned in Galatians. It's also called the trainer. The schoolmaster is the Torah or the trainer. It's how we learn what sin is, and at, that, at the time the animal sacrifices were in place, it also taught us how to atone. Galatians chapter 3, verses 21 through 26, five verses, they're misunderstood by the Alexandrian cult. The schoolmaster is the trainer that directs the details for the offering of animal blood for sins. The trainer was over us until Yahushua came to put an end to the animal offerings. The trainer had to exist to point the way to the final offering that would supersede all other offerings. This same tutor also trained us to know what our offenses are. It told us what was wrong with us. Paul discusses the Torah believed in to take away sins only temporarily, but Yahushua's blood offers infinitely more. Now here's the beginning of that that text. Uh, it's Galatians 3, starting at verse 21. Is the Torah then against the promises of Yahuwah? Let it not be. For if a law had been given that was able to make alive, truly righteousness would have been by Torah. But let's stop for a moment and remember that animal blood temporarily covered sin, and it was never a path to eternal life. Now, let's pick up. Now, but... The scripture, let me, let me get this set up here. The scripture has basically put everyone under sin. That the promise by belief in Yahushua Mashiach might be given to those who believe. But before belief came, we were being guarded 
under Torah, that's the animal sacrifices, having been shut up for the belief being about to be revealed, that would be Yahushua's blood, belief not just that he exists, but that his blood covers our sins. Therefore, Torah became our trainer to Mashiach in order to be, to be declared right by belief. After belief has come, we are no longer under a trainer, for you are all sons of Yahuwah through belief in Mashiach, Yahushua. Paul uses this word Torah to refer to the prescribed decrees that ceremonially, ceremonially covered the sins of a nation. There is confusion because the same word is used to refer to the moral instructions, which define sin for us. If the definition for sin has been annulled, then we can ignore the Ten Commandments entirely. The word law, or better, Torah, refers to the teachings of Yahuwah that train us in order to love him and how to love him and one another. That's what the Torah teaches us. When the Torah is violated, what we're really doing is we're failing to love. So we, we have sinned. To atone, animal blood was offered. The trainer that brought us to Yahusha was the Torah concerning animal sacrifices. Now the same word, Torah, is used to apply to the instructions for atoning for sin. Before Yahusha offered his own blood, trust had to be in the atoning blood of animals as shadows performed by priests. In other words, they were outlining what was about to happen in their activities. Now we trust in the object that cast the shadows, Yahusha's blood. The trainer or schoolmaster Paul is speaking of in Galatians concerns the former procedures using animal blood. Paul is misunderstood by those who are untrained in the belief. Another perspective of our instruction, or Torah training, involves that which defines sin for us. What we learn to be sin through the Torah is also taught to us by the same trainer, the Torah. The, school ma the schoolmaster teaches the young learner how to live properly. The Torah is the schoolmaster. When the student has learned what the schoolmaster has taught, it's time for the student to put what has been learned into practice. If the student thinks what he learned from the schoolmaster may be forgotten, he has been deluded. Now that's a strong delusion we read about in the scripture. Now the one that has no long that is that is learned, no the one that has learned and has been taught is no longer needing a schoolmaster. If they practice what they've learned, the Torah teaches us how to love Yahuwah, and how to love one another. And it produces behavior or fruit that Yahushua expects of us. So he's looking for the fruit, and the nine fruits of the Spirit, we know, starts with the, 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 the uh, fruit of love. Uh, Yahuwah's Torah is not toxic. A few years ago, as I listened to my radio while driving home from work, a Christian preacher was teaching against the works of the law. He said the Torah is toxic and must be kept far from a Christian's walk. His words knocked the breath out of me. Teachers that are captured in the Alexandrian cult understand works of the law to refer to obeying the commandments, which they call legalism. They say, you're legalistic if you keep the Sabbath, or you're legalistic if you worry about what name to call him. The works of the law that are spoken of in Scripture at Romans 3.28 and Galatians 2.16 pertain to the atonement provided by the, animal, uh, the offering of animal blood for sin, a shadow or pattern that pointed to the ultimate offering, the precious blood of Yahushua. Yahuwah's Torah is not toxic. Read Psalm 1, verse 1 through 6. This is Psalm 1. Contented is the man who shall not walk in the counsel of the wrong, and shall not stand in the path of sinners, and shall not sit in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the Torah of Yahuwah. And he meditates in his Torah, Yom and Lila. 
that's day and night. For he shall be as a tree planted by the rivers of water that yield its fruit in its season, and whose leaf does not wither, and whatever he does prospers. The wrong are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind blows away. Therefore the wrong shall not rise in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For Yahuwah knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked ones perish. You should see also Psalm 119. Now that is very interesting because it's talking about the Torah of Yahuwah being something that's going to give life to you. And there's something that is mentioned in Deuteronomy or Devarim chapter 30 at verse 19, that we're to turn back and choose life. What is choosing life? Choosing life is choosing the Torah to live by. Now, the teachings of men are highly toxic since they reject the things that produce loving kindness and right behavior. The Torah of Yahuwah is perfect. Psalm 19 verses 7 through 10 say, The Torah of Yahuwah is perfect, bringing back the being. The witness of Yahuwah is trustworthy, making wise the simple. The orders of Yahuwah are straight, rejoicing the heart. The command of Yahuwah is clear, enlightening the eyes. The fear of Yahuwah is clean, standing forever. The right rulings of Yahuwah are true. They are righteous altogether, more desirable than gold, than much fine gold, and sweeter than honey and the honeycomb. Now, supersessionists the replacement theology people that say that the covenant is superseded or annulled and the people themselves, Yishra or Israel, have been replaced by Christians. And they have inherited the promises and they have they don't have to obey the same covenant any longer, are are deceived. Now they do whatever helps them, such as obligatory tithing to them at obligatory weekly services. They take the role of the priesthood set up under the formal, former pattern of the schoolmaster. See, so the, there's, they're incongruent. They're, they're saying, well, while it doesn't exist anymore, they still say it does exist. They pick and choose what they want to keep that benefits them. And they recite texts out of context to make things appear to be something that they're not. For example, they'll quote this Galatians 6 verse 6, quote, and let him who is instructed in the word share in all that is good with him who is instructing, unquote. Now this would be fine if they were teaching obedience to Yahuwah's Torah and they held to the belief in Yahushua, and yet they're lawless. They're rejecting the instructions for living given by Yahuwah. They abhor legalism which is obedience. They're masters at twisting scriptures, and therefore, they're blind guides. Their Torah is not to be questioned. That's their Torah. Yet they claim Yahuwah's Torah is too hard, and no one is able to keep his Torah. I remember being in basic training in the Air Force, and we had to do some amazing things together as a group, and everybody was looking at each other going, I don't know if I can keep up. Well, you know, everybody, we had to run, we had to exercise, we had to learn things, we had to do all this thing, all these things, and we were being completely trained physically, mentally, emotionally, to perform the way that the system wanted us to perform. Well, everybody graduated. How did we graduate? Well, after we graduated, were, were we supposed to forget everything we were learning and the training that we received? Of course not. But we weren't under the schoolmaster anymore. See, we were being trained by this guy that was yelling at us. And uh, we said, well, we better do this. Because we were just 18-year-olds, you know, young boys. And uh, we were very frightened out of our wits, actually, being in a new place in a completely different environment. And we had to jump through a lot of hoops. And uh, But to say that we could forget everything we learned, that's just idiotic, you know. Um, now, here's what Yahuwah said about his Torah not being difficult. And it's a lot easier to keep his covenant than it is to go through basic training. For this command, which I am commanding you today, it is not too hard for you, nor is it far off. That's Deuteronomy 30, verse 11. Now, in the context of this verse, we find the curses for disobedience to his Torah. We would not remain in the land, 
but we'd be driven into the nations until we perish. That's a serious threat. See, they were in basic training. You know, we always call the uh, wilderness experience boot camp. Well, we're all in boot camp right now. Yahuwah has never taught anyone to do anything that was toxic to them. Now, toxic is a Latin word that means poison, and it's equivalent to venom, being venomous, something that's deadly. Yahuwah's Torah is not deadly. Yahuwah's Torah is behavioral training in how to love. Babel is the woman that we're called out from, and she is religion. Yahuwah never had a religion, you know. Her traditions have molded the minds of nations for thousands of years. Tradition is the gravity that imprisons hearts, keeping them from receiving Yahuwah's word and his name. See, his name and his word are above all. Psalm 138, verse 2. So the dragon and the false prophet attack these two things above all. The word and the name are constantly attacked. Yahushua searches for those with whom he can have companionship. His spirit is repelled by religion, which blinds us with men's traditions. That was true of the Pharisees as well. Every week, millions listen to teachings that inoculate them against returning to the everlasting covenant of kindness. They're taught the commandments have been done away, and a new covenant of only believe is now in place. Their program to believe Yahuwah's Torah is impossible for anyone to keep. The dragon continually fights against the truth. The covenant is considered toxic or poison to the minds of children. To escape the lawlessness, we have to decide whom we will serve, Yahuwah or men's teachings. You have to remember Romans verse, uh, chapter 6, verse 16. The whole Western world is under the influence of the culture that hatched at Alexandria. The church fathers and headmasters allegorized scripture and slowly molded a powerful hierarchy over all the illiterate masses. Rome enforced the idea that the church had superseded or replaced the people of Yisrael, who they taught had been rejected by Curios, or the Lord. They invented sacraments and Christograms to encode the name of Yahushua. They used this little symbol, I-C-X-C and I-H-S. Some of these remnants are still around. And then they eventually changed his name to J-E-S-U-S. Now, here's, here's what Malachi 4, verses 4 through 6, two verses say. Remember the Torah of Moshe, my servant, which I commanded him in Horeb for all Yisrael, laws and right rulings. See, I am sending you, Aliyahu, that's Elijah, the prophet, before the coming of the great and awesome day of Yahuwah. And he shall turn the hearts of the fathers to the children, and the hearts of the children to the fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with utter destruction. Now Yahushua told us to pray that our flight not be in winter or on the Shabbat, at Matthew 24, verse 20. And Shabbat is the sign between Yahuwah and his people forever. From the pattern that we see in this world, it appears the followers of the dragon have chosen Malachi 4's smiting of the earth with utter destruction because they have decided against the Torah of Moshe. They've decided to not obey it. And Yahushua also said at Mark 7, verse 8, forsaking the command of Elohim, you hold fast the tradition of men. And he said to them, well do you set aside the command of Elohim in order to guard your tradition. So, uh, Anyway, we're commanded in, in Revelation, in, I think, it's Revelation 18, 4 through 7, and I've got it right here. And I heard another voice from the heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, lest you share in her sins, and lest you receive of her plagues, because her sins have piled up to reach the heaven, and Elohim has remembered her unrighteousnesses. Render to her as she indeed did, re did render, and repay her double 
according to her works. In the cup which she has mixed, mix for her double. For as much as she esteemed herself and lived riotously, so much torture and grief give to her, because in her heart she says, I sit as a sovereigness, and I am not a widow, and I do not see mourning at all. Well, that's uh, the mother church is what it is. It's, she calls herself the mother. She, uh, they refer to their organization as mother church, and they want everyone to come back to the mother. The daughters need to come back. And that's the healing of the deadly wound. When they do, and they come back under the headship of the papacy, which is actually the the actual objective of the Jesuit order, is to is actually to return power back to the papacy. Anyway, another little interesting thing here is a quote. Now this is the guy they call Isaiah. His real name is Yashiyahu. It's verse eight, uh, chapter 8, verse 20. To the Torah and to the witness, if they do not speak according to this word, it is because they have no daybreak or no light in them, as some translations. Well, the Torah is the word Torah in that text. Why would that prophet say such a thing if the Torah is toxic of Yahuwah? And it says, and to the witness. Now that word, witness, in, in Hebrew the word is usually ed, ed, as we would transliterate it. The, uh, the actual word there is teuda. Teuda is, a, is like a sign that, or of certification. And it re it's related to the word Torah, but it's related in the way that if you were in Israel and you went up and you saw a sign on a window at a restaurant, that would be that sign would be called the teuda, the certification that everything inside is kosher. And that's something a lot of people don't know if they're not travelers. I'm not a traveler, but you know I'm a researcher. But these symbols or certificates that they put in the windows are called teuda. They don't have a teuda, so we ha we can't go eat there. Well, that's because the stuff might not be kosher. You know. That's the word witness in that text. So to the Torah and to the sign. And to the sign or the certification, yeah. The, what, what is permitted and what is forbidden, uh, the elders of, uh, that were, well, the, the first disciples of Yahushua were given the ability to bind and loose. Well, they weren't. It wasn't like whatever willy-nilly you'd like to do. You have to go to the Torah and find out whether it's permitted or forbidden. And that's what uh, binding means something is forbidden. Loosing means it's permitted. So if the Torah permits it, then it's loosed. And if the Torah forbids it, it's bound. You know, that's what we're all about. You know, we go to the Torah to find out how we're supposed to live. And I remember in my past, when I was going through some serious hurdles in my life, I'd go to the Torah and I'd find out what the heart of Yahuwah wanted. And I said, oh, well, we can't do this because this is written this way. And I would just turn, you know, turn around. Because you have to choose life. And that's what the life of following Messiah is all about. Mashiach tells you in your heart that you're out of bounds. And you just simply turn. And you say, well, I won't have anything to do with that. Your, your flesh might like it. But if you don't have his guide, this, his guidance, you will just do whatever you like. And... The more you uh, build up the muscles, so to speak, of obedience, the more you uh, turn away from things. And you just don't, and after a while, it becomes completely normal to keep his commandments because you're, you're in constant contact with him. Uh, that's not an email program. That's actually perfect harmony with his heart all the time. So you're always thinking with him all the time. And that's wonderful. That's a wonderful moment. Uh, when you turn away from his thoughts, then you feel it and you want to get back into a right relationship with him again. You know, when you start thinking your own thoughts alone without his Torah, you know, his teaching. So anyway, this is available as an article. 
Mm. So you're going to the Torah and discovering what's bound and what's permitted. You're not just going around screaming at demons and, I bind you, and <laughs> all that jazz yeah. we were taught in the old mother. Oh. Yeah, yeah, men's teachings can really throw you off, and mm. it's imagination. They, they've imagined things, mm. is what they've done. Mm. But uh, interestingly enough, there's a, there's a psalm, I think it's Psalm 25, let me see if I can find that. Uh, when we're talking about Torah, on Torah talk, it's really fun. Uh, Psalm 25, oh yeah, let's see, I think it's verse 14. The secret of Yahuwah is with those who fear him, and he makes his covenant known to them. Wow. What's his covenant? Well, his Ten Commandments, you know. We, we read those every time we get together. Uh, we're supposed to speak of these when we rise up, when we lie down, and sit in our home, and go in and out, walk along the road. The first commandment, let's look at this and see how hard this is relative to basic training in the Air Force. Number one, I am Yahuwah, your Elohim. Have no other before my face. Okay, that's not hard. Number two, you do not bow to idols. All right, that's easy. Just don't bow to idols. Number three, you do not cast the name of Yahuwah, your Elohim, to ruin. He keeps talking about his name, in my name, and for your name. All my people will know my name. Well, what's his name? Yahuwah. Number four. Remember Shabbat to keep it Kodesh. That means set apart from the common. Shabbat would be the seventh day. I mean, read Bereshith or Genesis chapter 1 and Genesis chapter 2. Okay. Number five. Respect your father and your mother. That's easy. Number six. You do not murder. I got through all day yesterday without having to murder anyone. It was pretty hard, but uh, probably because it was Sabbath. Oh, boy. Number seven, you do not break wedlock. You love your wife, you love your husband as a selfless way of giving yourself to them and serving them. You serve one another. Number eight, you do not steal. Number nine, you do not bear false witness against your neighbor. Whatever you want your neighbor to do to you, then treat him that same way. Number 10, you do not covet your neighbor's wife, house, field, servants, animals, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. And love one another. It's all good advice. These are all good. And these teach love. See, the first four teach us how to love him. And this, the last six teach us how to love one another. And Yahusha, in case we were too thick to get it, he said, I give you a new commandment. Love one another. He's, he's got a sense of humor, I think. Because did you miss it? You know. But instead, we have the fruits of the... Uh, of, it isn't the fruits of the Spirit that we have in it when we're born in this world. We have the opposite. We, we bear the fruits of wickedness. You know, We have hate, and jealousy, covetousness, drunkenness, uh, the, you know, the abuse of drugs. Uh, just, they just tear our, our bodies up. And uh, that's the, the way we're wired in the normal way. But when we have a relationship with him, then we're you know, going towards life. You know, that's why he kept saying, choose life. That's at Deuteronomy 30, verse 19. Actually, Deuteronomy 30, 31, and 32 are all about the warnings that Moshe was giving to us. And uh, I think the song of Moshe is, a, is to be learned by his redeemed people. It's kind of a poem, and it's all about turning back. If you think we should read that, I don't know. It's it's really a wonderful thing. Let me see if I can find Deuteronomy 30, 
32, I mean, uh, Moshe sang these words, Give ear, O heavens, and let me speak. And give ear, O earth, the words of my, and hear, O earth, the words of my mouth. Let my instruction fall as rain, my speech drop down as dew, as fine rain on the tender plants, and as showers on the grass. For I proclaim the name of Yahuwah, ascribe greatness to our Elohim, the rock. His work is perfect, for all his ways are right ruling, and owl of truth and without unrighteousness, righteous and straight is he. He is without unrighteousness. A twisted and crooked generation has corrupted itself. They are blemish. They are they are blemished. They are not his children. Do you do this to Yahuwah, O foolish and unwise people? Is he not your father who brought, who bought you, who created you and established you? Now this is a very good text right here. But I wanted to stop at this one because this is the one I wanted to go to. Deuteronomy thirty two seven. Remember the days of old. Consider the years of many generations. Ask your father and let him show you, your elders, and let them say to you, when the Most High gave the nations their inheritance, when he separated the sons of Adam, he set the boundaries of the peoples according to the number of the children of Yisrael. Now, he's not talking about Catholics or Christians. He's talking about all the people that he scattered. And in Deuteronomy um, chapter 1, I believe, he talks about something very interesting, too. He says, oh, it's chapter 30. It's 30, chapter 30, verse 1. It shall be, okay, this is it. It says, it shall be, and it shall be when these were, all these words come upon you, the blessing and the curse which I have set before you, and you shall bring them back to your heart among all the Gentiles, where Yahuwah your Elohim drives you, and shall turn back to Yahuwah your Elohim, and obey his voice, according to all that I command you today, with all your heart, with all your being, you and your children, then Yahuwah your Elohim shall turn back your captivity, and shall have compassion on you, and he shall turn back and gather you from all the peoples, where Yahuwah your Elohim has scattered you. And if any of you are driven to the farthest parts under the heavens. From there, Yahuwah your Elohim does gather you, and from there he does take you. Now that, those first four verses are awesome. It's Deuteronomy or Debarim chapter 30, verses 1 through 4. And see, that's what's happening right now. These words are coming upon us where he scattered us. See, I'm in North America. You're in Australia. There's people all over. They're out in the Philippines. They're uh, on Hawaii. They're, they're living in India. They're in England. They're all over the European theater. They're in Africa. They're everywhere. They're in New Zealand. We know one another somewhat. We don't get much fellowship together, but... And there's a lot of division among us, too. But it's because we're scattered that we don't agree about the moon. And look out, uh, you know, I don't know how you say his name. Well, we're learning. We're all learning. But we have to love the redeemed. You know, that's the, the whole goal is to learn how to love, not how to spell. But we're trying. We're children. We're lost. We're scattered. But we're returning back to the covenant, see? And that's the evidence. These words are actually happening. You know, it's saying that when these things come back to our heart, not just the words about the blessing and the cursing, but the commandments, you know. Yes, it is. I had a, I had a, a comment. There's a, there's an actual website called debate.com if you if you all go to debate.com right now it won't be there very long but it's possible that someone could come along that would be able to debate me I've got a it's under the heading of religion but um, it's about replacement theology and I'm I'm coming against the idea of replacement theology that there that the Christians have not supplanted or replaced Israel. They are the ones that have to engraft into Israel. 
Ephesians chapter 2 and 3, Yermiyahu chapter 3, or Jeremiah chapter 3. These are ideas that we, that the Gentiles who were, actually we become the Gentiles is what's happening. Israel was scattered in order for the Gentiles to be called back because they've, they've become interspersed so finely. Amos 9 verse 9 describes it as we we're being sifted among the Gentiles. And now he's calling us back to his covenant. The prodigal son is coming back to the father's household, his Torah. You know, it's not easy for a Christian to hear this because they're indoctrinated with the, the subtle concepts that they're perfect now and they don't have to obey the commandments, but they inherit all the promises. These are facts. They changed the covenant. They've turned the covenant into wormwood. They said, oh, the Sabbath. No, no, it's the first day of the week. They still do a lot more legalism. And, oh, well, let's call it that if, if that's what they're used to, to keep the Sunday. Because they're going every week to this fellow that's teaching them this stuff. And it's, you don't have to do that. You can stay in your house. Exodus 16 says, let every man stay in his place on the Sabbath. What are you supposed to do on the Sabbath? Well, read Exodus 16. Some of them went out of their place and they said, let's go do this. Let's go do that. Let's find some food. He said, don't do it. Just, what's this day about? It's about resting. The Sabbath is about resting. And now there's a lot of infiltrators that have come into the fold that are saying, it's not a repeating seven-day cycle. It isn't. What? <laughs> uh, Anyway, the, we've, we've got a video on, it's called The Heartbeat of Creation, if anybody wants to look it up on YouTube. The Heartbeat of Creation basically analyzes scripture and, and tries to find out if there is a heartbeat of a repeating seven-day cycle. Everybody looks up and uh, a lot of people are falling for these doctrines about the moon. You know, the moon is setting the week. Yahuwah has the ability to say that. He never says it. He does use the moon for the festivals, the appointed times, but he's not able, he's not um, incapable of, of saying, you know, uh, the week, by the way, is uh, seven days and it's set by the moon. All he has to do is tell us, but he doesn't say that. See, that's a creation thing. It's an echo. It's a, well, it's a repeating cycle, like the keys on a, on a, on a piano. You know, they start out you know, with C, if you're in the key of C, and it goes seven notes. But uh, the cool thing is we don't have to vibrate twice as fast. The musicians out there will understand that comment. <laughs> Very interesting, huh? Well, it's a fun study. Mm. And uh, it's something that people don't realize is in the background of what they've been listening to. Mm. But you have to engraft to become into the covenant in order to share with the promises. You know, the promises are very clear. Uh, Yermiyahu chapter 3 would be a good one to, to learn, I mean to read. It, uh, starting around verse 14 of Yermiyahu or Jeremiah 3, verse 14. Return, O backsliding children, declares Yahuwah. For I shall rule over you, and shall take you, one from a city and two from a clan, and shall bring you to Sion. And I shall give you shepherds according to my heart, and they shall feed you with knowledge and understanding. And it shall be when you have increased, and shall bear fruit in those days, in the land in those days, declares Yahuwah, that they no longer say, The Ark of the Covenant of Yahuwah. Neither would it be brought, neither would it come to heart, nor would they remember it, nor would they visit it nor would it be made again. At that time, Jerusalem shall be called the throne of Yahuwah, and all the nations shall be gathered to it, to the name of Yahuwah, to Jerusalem, and no longer walk after the stubbornness of their evil. In those days, the house of Yehuda shall go to the house of Yisrael, and they shall come together out of the land of the north to the land that I have given as an inheritance to your fathers. But I said, how would I put you among the children and give you a pleasant land, a splendid, a, a splendid inheritance to the hosts of nations? And I said, call me my father, 
and do not turn away from me. But indeed, as a wife betrays her husband, so you have betrayed me, O house of Yisrael, declares Yahuwah. A voice was heard in the bare heights, weeping supplications for the children of Yisrael, because they have perverted their way. They have forgotten Yahuwah, their Elohim. Return, O backsliding children, and I shall make your backsliding cease. See, we have come to you, for you are Yahuwah, our Elohim. So it's talking about uh, the returning, you know, the repentance. That's what our life is. It's just a, a continual repentance back to the covenant. And we turn and we turn and we turn. We never stop turning, you know, with the, under the power of Yahushua. Because he will give, it, give us the, the power to obey. Mm. Yeah. So it's a study that we need to look at. And, uh, I didn't spend any time looking at the falsehoods. Uh, I looked at more of the scripture. But you see, when you want to study counterfeit, how do you study counterfeit uh, money? Do you look at the counterfeit money? No. You look at the real thing. That's what you do. <laughs> and that that way you can tell the counterfeit. But if you're always looking and listening to the counterfeit, the lie, then you'll never know when the you know the counterfeit's really there because you've been listening to it, you know. But if you study the truth, and that's this is an amazing fact, but eight out of ten Christians do not even read all of the scriptures through in their lifetime. Hmm. Eight out of ten. So they're just going to their their circus, and they're listening to somebody who's responsible for teaching them, and they're hearing lies mixed with truth. It's poison water. It's wormwood. They've turned the, the truth on its head. You don't have to do that. That was for them. Well, if that was for them, being the Jews or, the, or Israel, then why isn't it for you too? There's to be one law for all the people. And there's only one body. There's not two bodies. Daniel and Moshe and Aharon and uh, Enoch and all these people that we hear about in the scriptures, they're not one body and we're another body. We're all, we're all joined in the same covenant together. You know, we love Yahuwah and we obey his voice. And it, we listen to one voice. We don't listen to these other shepherds. See, the false shepherds teach against the Torah of Yahuwah. That's the way you can discern them. Mm. You know? I've been thinking this week about the concept of being invaded um, and trying not to be invaded, not letting my vessel be invaded. Because, um, of course, if that happens, uh, your behavior changes. Um, whether it be to your wife or to clients or to your children, uh, if you just lose your cool or go off the handle and you, you get invaded with judgments and evil spirits, that sort of thing. And um, I thought that would be an interesting thing to address, looking at scripture in the future, um, just for believers to know what really is coming at them in their mind, the principalities that are coming at them in the first person, talking to them as though they're them, um, as though they're us, so we think it's us. Um, I thought that would be an interesting topic to address in the future, using scripture as the basis, like I said, looking at the at Yahushua, not the, not the evil, but looking at Yahushua. Um, and I also, last weekend, I think it was on telly, I was sat down with the boys and we were watching the Matrix trilogy, and... Um, so ever since I watched that, I've just the concept of being a slave and um, Israel being scattered, but being so uh, indoctrinated and bombarded, plugged into a false system uh, to keep them asleep to who they really are, and they're just a slave. All that, all that, all that metaphors and things they use in that movie were just like, oh, that's just fabulous. Oh yeah, I'm just looking at it. Oh, amazing, and. Uh, so all these things have been bounced around in my head for to do something with it. I don't know what yet. If you feel inspired, you might be able to do something with it. But just I just thought the idea of being a slave, um, the whole world is not allowed to know. And if somebody starts to wake up, like in the movie, if somebody starts to wake up to the fact that 
this isn't real, this is a dream, uh, I need to wake up, then they just get bombarded. They get bombarded, bombarded, bombarded. Like you said about the circus, they go along and they get inoculated and they just go back to sleep. Um, and they're a slave again. Um, so I haven't really put it into a point yet, but just me personally, in my day, I'm just trying to um, not get invaded, I'm trying to keep that at the front of my mind. Don't get invaded, don't get invaded. If you get angry, lose your cool, don't do what Torah says, you, that's it, your spirits, you get invaded. You, you behave, your changes, and you get smacked around while you're here, it's not fun. So you gotta, you gotta confess the truth and get out and get free. So sorry, repent. But, um, so yeah, that's, that's what I've been thinking about this week. <laughs> well, you know, it's amazing. We have the same mind. Shared, we're sharing Yahusha's mind. And he was putting on my heart to do a study and maybe call it the armor of light. And it would be based on Ephesians chapter 6, mm. you know, as kind of the, the tonic uh, or base, basic. Power. And uh, the, the armor of Yahuwah is you have to have the complete armor, you know. And it's, he uses the metaphor of a soldier, the helmet, the shield, the sword, the belt, the shoes. Everything has to have a, a purpose and a function, and a breastplate, of course. Yeah, and uh, these are all symbols of things. And it's amazing that you had had the same idea, because these are, we're in a war. We're in a war. And we're fighting with weapons of love, not, it's, an, it's just the opposite. It's like Yahu, Yahusha himself. While we were yet sinners, he died for us. Mm. He wasn't punishing us for our, you know, we're, we're in, in revolt. And instead of punishing us in our rebellion, he's, he's dying for us. Mm. And we, we stop and think about that. We think about, well, why would I want to continue in sin then? And he's actually done the ideal thing, you know. But uh, the weapons that we wrestle, we wrestle uh, against principalities and authorities, which are hierarchies of demonic beings, like you were saying. These things that attack us are real. They're just not seen. Uh, Ephesians 6 says, because we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against authorities, against the world rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual matters of wickedness in the heavens. So it's in another dimension, like the Matrix movie is giving you reality as compared with the fantasy world. And like you were saying, they're inoculated to keep them asleep and dreaming about something that's not real mm. and the things that people are taught are not real christmas e-a-s-t-e-r the money rabbit thing halloween even the sunday meeting thing is mm. is not real it's not in scripture you can't find a place where you can find any of those things in the scriptures the behavior is not there but they've created an artificial world constructed by men that they just cycle through and uh, this was done to them they don't know it. That's why we're trying to wake them up. This was done to you. You're, you, don't, you don't realize it, but everything that you're doing and seeing in your experience is artificial. You know. It's, is that the first time you've ever seen The, the Matrix? No, I saw them years ago. Um, okay. But coming at it fresh with my mind now, um, <laughs> I just went, wow, and you know, the black guy standing there with his glasses going, you're a slave, you know, and, yeah. and you know, the system, everybody's so dependent on the system, they're not ready to be woken up yet, I'm just like, oh, yeah. wonderful, you know, like, it's, it's so true, they're dependent on the system in there, I just thought it would be wise, I know we're not supposed to dwell on the evil and the spirits and everything, but I thought it would be wise to just put something together about what the enemy is really like. Because I think particularly people that come out of religion have a bit of a warped view about the enemy. They, they think that they can control the enemy. They think they can talk to it and say stop, or, or things like that. They think they, they, have, they think they have power, you know what I mean? They, and they don't realize that most of the time, the thoughts that they are thinking, 
that are theirs, even when they look in the mirror and they might think, oh, you look horrible today. That's not even their thought. Because Yahusha doesn't talk like that, you know? Um, I think it would be wise to put something together to explain to them, this is exactly what the enemy is like. These are the sort of things the enemy does to keep you down, to keep you depressed. Even when you've been woken up and you're in Atsurim, you're in Israel, you, you've begotten him again, you've got him in you, you still get bombarded. And half the time people don't realise why. Am I getting attacked or am I getting flogged from Yahusha? Is this evil or is it human? Like there's this, and then in the end they go, they just keep plodding along. It's they're not conscious, not conscious. So I don't know. Put a bit more thought into it. But, um, well, it's all going to connect with scripture, and, and yeah. that's why people don't understand scripture is because they're still in the mind of the flesh, and the mind of the flesh is the matrix of artificiality, mm. and the mind of the flesh is uh, motivated, you know, by the basically. The, uh, the eyes and pride and basically possessions and position and uh, these are all unimportant things the world mm -hmm. the wor it, it become if we love the world then we made ourselves enemies of Yahuwah. Mm -hmm. and you know the the possessions and and the and the importance of power and position and uh, you know just the desires of the of the flesh yeah. we we come away from all this and we see it, but the people that are still embedded in the mind of the flesh are not following the mind of the spirit of Yahushua. So he goes, he, what this is really about is he dwells you and shares his point of view of the world. And you see it and you go, well, there's the behavior that you're talking about. And he shares these thoughts with you. And you can see that staying up late at night and using drugs and getting drunk and and, and then waking up in the morning and feeling like somebody beat you up. Uh, this is... <laughs> how did you know? <laughs> <laughs> how, do I, how would I know? Well, uh, I yeah. haven't ever suffered alcoholism or drug abuse, you know, I, to the point where... I mean, I did experience one time in the Air Force, I remember I had a, a whole bottle of wine. And boy, did I get... I paid... I got paid righteously for that. And I woke up the next morning and... Uh, Oh my, it was like a completely different world, and I was thinking, oh my, I'll never do that again. But uh, I was depressed too, I guess, because I was in the military and I didn't really care for it, but I still did my job. But the thing of it is, the flesh is not the place to sow, you know. You, you sow to the Spirit. And look, look to Yahushua for your answers. He'll give you the answer if you just turn to him. But putting on the armor of Elohim is clothing yourself in, in Yahusha. Yahusha will become a covering to you. And the armor is actually him. And he will direct your paths. And he will protect you from the darts of the enemy. You know, things that people say about you are deflected. Your heart is pure. And it's because of the fact you have a relationship with him. It's the same thing when the spies went into the land of Yisrael, the, the land that was being promised to them. And ten of the spies said, oh, I, I, we can't possibly do this. But the two spies, uh, Caleb and Yahushua, they saw who was with them. They realized it wasn't just them. They realized they had Yahushua with them, or Yahuwah. Because uh, their eyes were open. To the fact that these people might have been giants, but they don't even have a, a chance. Mm. It's who's with us that gives us confidence and mm. power. So that's really the war that we're, I mean, when we're in the battle, and we're in the battle continually, he protects mm. us while we sleep. We have to thank him. Mm. We have to give thanks, and we have to give praise, and then we can make our requests, and prayers for others, you know, and uh, in his will, of course, not just because we want it, you know, but mm. if, it, if it's something that we can pray for that is going to accomplish his will, you know, then it's going to be provided, you know, mm. and if it isn't, he just says, wait for it, nope, not yet, you know, and wait, be patient, That we have to cultivate patience, mm. uh, which is another fruit that you know, we have to draw from him. 
Mm-hmm. See, these fruits of the Spirit come from Him. That's why they're called fruits of the Spirit. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But the uh, armor of Elohim is what is going to give us the power mm-hmm. to stand against the schemes of the devil. And that's mm-hmm. what you're talking about, you know, the schemes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we've got to check our thoughts seriously because I was reminded earlier this week that the minute you wake up in the morning, they're there ready to pounce, ready to fill you with negativity and judgments. You might you might wake up to children screaming, you might wake up to other thoughts, oh I don't want to go to work, oh I've got such and such a client, oh who the hell's screaming, oh my god, you know, and so you're filled with these, ju- and you don't want to get out of bed then, they've got you, they've got you depressed, before you even start the day, you're down, or is that, that's not Yahushua, that's not how Yahushua feels, and um, so it's, it's really so important to face where the thoughts come from. Yeah, I know I don't feel like that. No, I'm, I'm going to be happy. I don't know what today holds. Um, Yahushua's going to do some amazing things today. Get you yeah. positive. Staying positive, not getting invaded in your vessel. Because that's how they want, that's how the dragon wants us. Yeah. Mm. Oh, yeah. And when we do things uh, like we, well, I noticed that when I start redoing a book, like fossilized customs, or I, I write an article, even, you know, I'm attacked. Hmm. Things hmm. are happening to people that are around me. Like last year was the worst year that I think I've ever had in terms of uh, all the demonic attacks, you know, hmm. uh, and just horrible things uh, were happening, you know. Hmm. Of course, it's, you know, we still made it through because Yahushua protects us. And, uh, we're making it, but we just hold on and stand firm. He just wants us to stand still and watch what he's doing because he's in charge. And if we, if, if we deceive ourselves and we say, oh, I've got, I'm losing control, well, you never had control. <laughs> See, that's what makes us angry is when we become fearful because we're losing control. But in reality, what's happening is we have to re- remember that he's always been in control Mm. and he might be letting us learn that we're not in control and until we learn that lesson that he'll keep allowing the same things to happen until we learn that Mm. and we can be at peace and say oh i don't have to worry or be anxious because he's in charge that's it all right well, that's amazing, brother. Yeah. Well, keep me posted on what uh, what comes to. You. <laughs> well, Yahushua's mm-hmm. teaching all of us. Yeah. I ask him to teach me something so that I can teach others, and mm-hmm. whatever it is. Uh, of course, we're drawing on a uh, you know scriptural well. You know, the scriptures mm-hmm. are the source for everything. Without the scriptures, boy, we'd be in complete darkness. Mm-hmm. The world would wouldn't even be here probably. We would have annihilated one another. Mm. Uh, the, you know, all the selfishness, you know, right. anger. Mm. But uh, Yahushua and his kindness has given us his word, you know. Mm. Yeah. I had a uh, client this week, sort of very robust, so sort of just sort of explaining to me why doesn't the Creator make himself known? If this is all true, what you're saying, why doesn't he make? Why doesn't he come down and make? I say he did. He did. He made himself known. He, he died, and still they didn't believe him. You know, they, religion covered it all up. And but why does there have to be war and kids dying? And why didn't he come? Doesn't he come down and just set everyone straight? You know, and I'm trying to say, well, he did. Religion has just covered it up and taken away his name and taken away all the truth. And I don't think she was convinced, but. Anyway, <laughs> the Torah, the Torah of Yahuwah. Yeah, the Torah of Yahuwah. Mm. The, these are the key to our success and our failure. Mm. Psalm one, Psalm one nineteen. Yeah, mm. read it, and you you see he's consistently telling us that if you hold fast to his covenant, that he's going to make your ways straight and. Everything would be changed if everybody taught their children mm-hmm. as he told. But instead, the governments are, of course, 
teaching that you can't do these things. You know, I don't know how bad it is in Australia, but here in schools, it, you have to be in a private school in order to hear, you know, the, the truth. Yeah, so. You can't, you know, possibly teach the truth mm. in a public school because they're, they're using uh, tax dollars for that. And they can't promote that. Why yeah. not? You know. Anyway. anyway, she didn't seem convinced by what I said, but she did buy a fossilized, so maybe she'll go through that. So. <laughs> well, yeah, because the pure truth is such a bright light and it's set on such a different level than the mind of the flesh can understand, because the mind of the flesh reading the scriptures mm. is not going to get it. You have to have his spirit in you to understand it, you know, mm. and you have to have the key also. The key is usually taken away in most of the translations. You don't have the name of the creator in there. It's just uh, removed. Mm. So the adversary has been running this parade for a long time and uh, keeping all the people away from the name and the word. So stay away from those Ten Commandments and don't use the real name because he doesn't want to hear it or we don't want to hear it or something. I don't know. It's... Uh, really bizarre. It's too special to, to say. So we won't write it down and we won't say it. It's insane. Yes, it is. It's, I've got it on my shirt. Mm. You know, <laughs> and it's a mysterious name. These four letters, scholars, grown men are saying, no one knows how to say it. <laughs> is that real? And that's what the sheep are hearing. The people that are, uh, you know, untaught and untrained are trying to learn, and their their leaders are saying, "No one knows how to say it." And uh, so we'll you know, just call him Lord. <laughs> yeah, we'll just do that. And then somebody like you or me comes up and goes, "But isn't that B A A L?" You know, look up that in the Webster's. Mm. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it's amazing. Well, that's amazing understanding, brother. It's been a pleasure chatting with you again. Oh, it's always good to see you. Yeah. I just saw you a week ago. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, I figured we should do this uh, while it's fresh because who knows what will happen in weeks to come. Yeah, you never know. Yeah. You know. So. Well, you know, do the work and mm. uh, just keep working hard. And, you know, and re re read uh, Yermiyahu or Jeremiah 6, verse 16. That's going to clinch the whole thing for you because mm. we're returned to the old paths yeah. yeah okay well enjoy the rest of your weekend mate you too and oh you're already pretty much uh yeah tomorrow's the first day of the first work day for you yeah definitely yeah well we love you yeah love you too all right we'll see you like later on yeah. see you later Bye. Bye. Usher in the ladder ring So the world's gonna know your name You're making love to demons In the synagogue tonight Has come to his senses The awakening brought me this far Cause I am falling Deeper in love with you He was pierced for our transgression Bruised for our iniquity The punishment that brought our peace Was upon him 